Welcome to Shoreline Conversations. I'm Thomas, the producer of this podcast, and we are on session three or episode three of our Pillars uh, series, talking about the pillars of Christian faith, what Christians believe, the theology behind what Christians believe, and uh, it's uh, very thematic, very uh, um, timely. We are talking about the death and resurrection of Jesus, and uh, we're we're a day late from our usual Wednesday release, just with scheduling. It's uh, it's Thursday at the time of recording this, um, but that means it's one day before Good Friday and uh, a few days before Easter. So the timing of this podcast uh, is uh, it's right on point. So hopefully this is a good launch into the Easter weekend. Um, or if you're catching this after the Easter weekend, you know it's it's never a bad time to talk about really the the cornerstone of Christian faith. So uh, Keith is back hosting. We had a little audio problem last week, and it kind of said, you know, told told me I should be back behind the cockpit, you know, with the uh, with the all the dials and knobs so I can catch that kind of thing. So Keith is back with us hosting this week, and uh, I hope you enjoy the conversation about the death and resurrection of Jesus between Keith and Kevin. Well, we're in our third podcast on pillars of the, the Christian faith. Yeah. I'm excited to be here with you today, Kevin. I appreciate you being here, and I'm glad I get this opportunity to engage in this once again. I've Still missed you. Yeah, I've missed you. Missed it was me. great doing the first two with Thomas, and uh, good to have you back, and uh, just looking forward to, to talking together. Well, last week you talked about the incarnation of uh, Jesus, and, and today we're going to talk about the death and resurrection. It's Easter yeah. time and yeah. Good Friday, and yeah. we're all about that. Um, so just let's just jump right in. Yeah. Historically speaking, why why was Jesus killed historically? Hmm. It's it's a great question, and there's it's a it's a probably like most things in life, it's a multifaceted answer. Uh, and so people have people have been asking that question uh, since, especially people of faith. Um, why why would he have to die if Jesus was God among us in the incarnation, which we talked about in the last podcast? Right. Um, why would God have to die? As a matter of fact, I pulled off my shelf a book that I read years ago called What Was God Doing on the Cross? Hmm. It's just a question, what was God doing on the cross? And Alistair McGrath, Alistair has got a PhD in microbiology from Oxford and a PhD in theology from Oxford. And I just pulled up his website and was looking at it. He presently holds the chair of some, I mean, he's, it's like he does this, 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 and he's part of a, a small group of pastors who pastor small country churches also. Oh, so wow. he's this incredible theologian, Neat. incredible apologist, defender of the faith. And so... Uh, and so I, you know, the things I share, I've been gathered and gleaned from the scriptures, and then from theologians and right, thinkers from you know, f- over time and from around the world. But, but you know, as people have grappled with this question, uh, you know, why why was Jesus killed? You know, from a historical standpoint, it, it kind of depends on when if you who you're looking at and, right. and what you're addressing. So if you say some people will say, well, really, it was the Jewish, uh, the Jewish. Uh, religious slash political system that put Jesus on the cross. There's no question that uh, the, the Jews of Jesus' day were deeply jealous of him. Uh, he, they, they, in many ways, didn't like him. And if you read the Gospels and read uh, sections like John chapter 8, mm-hmm. where Jesus is going back and forth with the uh, religious leaders and saying things like, you know, you think your father is Abraham, you think your father is God, but your father is the devil. Um <laughs> Uh, you know, from a cultural standpoint, you, you, you say them, them, them is fighting words. Yeah, I mean, that, that's, 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 that's like that sure. is that is a a uh, so so Jesus wasn't uh, easy on the religious establishment. Right. Uh, he was gracious and kind towards many people, usually the broken, the hurting, the outcast, the marginalized, the the spiritually wandering. But this group of people who thought they had it all figured out spiritually, and and they did have it all figured out spiritually, but the problem is they were completely wrong. And so some would say, well, if if it's, if it's we're looking at the Jewish religious establishment, uh, why did they have him killed? Jealousy, mm. um, raw bitterness, uh, power grab. Uh, we're, we're, we're in a time right now, historically, where people are referring a lot to power grabs from a political standpoint. Well, the, the scribes, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the, the teachers of the law, all this religious community uh, had incredible power. And Jesus is coming into human history, uh, put a lot of that at risk. Right. And what people will do to protect their own power, to you know, as human beings, as sinful human beings, is uh, heartrending historically. When you see what people will do, well, in Jesus' day, so if if you say, well, it was the Jewish establishment 
uh, that put him on the cross, then I would say, well, the reason Jesus was killed historically was because of jealousy, because of bitterness, because of control, uh, because of a desire to not become obsolete. And, and so that's, that's one response. You say, well, wait a minute now, kind of turn the camera and the lens over to the Roman world. Because you say, well, really, it was Pilate and the Roman political establishment that had the power to hand him over to the Jews. The Jews could not crucify somebody without the permission of the Romans. Right. Uh, just at that time in history, uh, the Jews were under Roman rule, and they didn't like that at all, but that's the way it was. So they would have to go to the Roman rulers and get permission, but then they would carry out um, their process of judging, and then they would hand the person back to the Romans because crucifixion was a Roman right. punishment. Uh, the, the Jews, everyone, everyone had a way to kill people. Um, sadly, you know, the, the, the Jewish people stoning. They like stones. Sto yes. that, that, you know, so so um, and I, not you know, neither was trying to make light of that, but, no, the, but the reality sure. is, as no. human beings with all the tension in the world, um, yeah, boy, you can't you can't know human history at all and not recognize the depravity of the human condition and that through all of history Always. and every right. part of the world, wars, conflicts, jealousy, all these things. But so the Romans also, uh, they were in power. It was, right. it, was, you know, it was interesting. They would talk about uh, Roman peace, Pax Romana. Uh, uh, Pax, not Romana, Pax Romana. Uh, and you know, <laughs> Ro Roman peace. And yet their peace was bought with a lot of blood. Uh, their peace came because they ruled with an iron fist. Right. So... When, when Jesus was you know, treated as a king, when the crowds cried out, Hosanna, when people said, Jesus is our sovereign, that was a, that was a conflict against Roman power. And so you know, did the Romans hand Jesus over to the Jews because of fear of the power of Jesus? I actually don't think so. It doesn't seem like it. It doesn't seem like it. I think that they felt like they had power over everything. But, but they did want to be politically sensitive and they wanted to uh make sure that they kept the jewish people from spiking and and you know the, right. part of the roman rule was navigating all the conquered peoples and all the people that they ruled over and so you might say well then did the romans hand jesus over or, or, or get, give you know him to the jewish people which would make them culpable and, and blameworthy in some ways uh because they were afraid of the power of jesus probably not were they afraid that jesus was actually a king well, there were lots of insurrections and Jewish people that rose up, but I don't think they were afraid of that. I think it was just pragmatic. I think they just said, you know what? Um, we don't want to deal with this. You know, Pilate washes his hands and right. says, I have nothing to do with this. Uh, it's, it's that kind of a feeling. Mm -hmm. So that, that would be a Jewish response. Uh, why was Jesus you know, killed historically? If we look at um, historical Christian doctrine and theology, then we go in a whole new direction. And we'll, we'll get more into that. Right. But, but I, you know, I don't think that Jesus actually went to the cross ultimately because of the power of the, the Jewish influence in the world at that time. I don't think he went to the cross because of the power of Roman control of the world, even though they seemed to control almost all of the known world at that time. Uh, I think it's something much deeper and more theological. And that's why I think this is an exciting conversation. Yeah, I, will, I look forward to getting into that yeah. part. One of the, uh, just triggered something in my head about the, the Jewish people and their response. And you talked about them in the streets chanting Hosanna. Mm -hmm. It's often said that the same people who praised Jesus as he came into the city yeah. were the same people that took his life ultimately. Yeah. I don't know I've ever had someone ask the question, was it actually the exact same people? Yeah. Like, Do you think that the people that were actually on the street excited about the arrival of Jesus mm -hmm. were also there yeah. chanting for his death? Or do you yeah. think it was the Jewish people in general and some of them yeah. were... Yeah. praising him and some of them were wanting yeah. his life to be taken yeah a, a good question and one that's tricky to under uh, tricky to to explain only that we weren't there we weren't so there we don't for know. sure but no. but i think that i think that when you look at the the fickleness of the human heart and how you can watch people who are you know you you're, you're you've been a diehard fan of what team for most of your life well, I have lots of teams, but well, let's you, say you, the football, football. Oakland Raiders. Oakland Raiders, okay. Well, now they're in Las Vegas. They were in Los La Angeles. Los, they've okay, moved the, around the, a lot. Let's, the Raiders. The Raiders. They, they've, they've kept, okay. <laughs> so you have been a a pretty consistent fan for most of your life. Absolutely. As Since long like as you, 1981. Okay. Yeah. And so you know, you've been devout. You've been committed. You, that's part of your temperament, right? Right. But you also watch most people in sports, and they tend to, you know, Warriors fans, mm -hmm. right? There, there's Come people that go. became huge Warriors fans when they were winning uh, five, six years ago. Five, six, right? yeah, yeah. When, when they, when, there's people that jump on the bandwagon. Right. 
um, people who actually stick with almost anything anymore are more the rarity. Right. So there is fickle kind of human uh, tendency to say, could could one person have been there saying, you're just kind of swept up in the crowd and start you know, crying out, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And that same person under the influence of the religious establishment, mm. because we read in the scriptures that, um, that part of the reason that the crowds said, give us Barabbas, what should we do with Jesus crucify? It was because out of their jealousy, the religious leaders had primed the pump, uh -huh. you know, greased the slide and gotten the crowds ready. So I think you may have some people who are just, uh, they just jumped in whatever was big and happening, which is part of the way human beings are. Right. And you have other people that were probably different people that were there who were mourning over what they saw happen to Jesus. And uh, but, but really you have a crowd of people they were heavily influenced by a religious institution, which would point back again to the Jewish establishment. Uh, but again, I don't, I don't point my finger ultimately at the Jewish or the Roman. Um, I don't know if the same people were in both those situations, but it's clear that a large group of people were thrilled that Jesus was coming. Um, right. They were anticipating a political um, upheaval overturning of the of the Roman government. They were looking for a political savior. And I think at this point, even though it's a short time later, it was becoming very clear to them that what they had hoped Jesus would be, mm -hmm. a political, uh, cultural icon that could gather people and turn them against the Roman government and somehow set the, the Jewish people free, it was, it was becoming pretty clear that wasn't going to happen. So at that point, if some were disappointed that it wasn't Jesus and wasn't who they anticipated, right. they could have then said, "Well, then who cares?" Right. That's yeah, my, that's my you, best kind of. You said fickle. We yeah, we are yeah, fickle. Yeah. We're then are today. You know, yeah. easily yeah. shifting because yeah, it's, we're talking a matter of days. You yeah. know, oh, yeah. guess it's not going to happen. The overthrow of the government's yeah. not going to happen in just a few days. Uh, you, you talked about the, this book that you pulled off your shelf. Yeah. Uh, what was God doing on the cross? I believe yeah. is the name of it. Um, so if God was on the cross, why didn't he save himself? If, if Jesus is God and yeah. is on the cross, yeah. why did he let this yeah. happen the way it did? Yeah. And that was one of the questions that, uh, that people who are observing this at the time were asking that question. Right. Uh, the, at least one of the thieves on the cross said, hey, save yourself and uh, uh, while you're at it, <laughs> why not us? save us too. If you, if you are who you say you are, Pop off the cross, right. save yourself, and and take us kind of sweep us into that right. drama along with you. Uh, there were religious leaders that were mocking, saying he said he was a king. He said he was he said he was powerful. If you if you are who you say you are, come on down, save yourself. So that question has been was asked even then. And so we have to, we have to almost go backwards beyond the circumstances because if if you ask the question, could Jesus have saved himself? Right. The answer is yes. Could Jesus have said? Going backwards, you know, b before they drove the nails into his wrists, into his feet, enough, this is done in my power, poof, what, you know, what, right. whatever poof, would be, you know, right. uh, away with you uh, into the cornfield <laughs> or in, you know, in you know, immediate incineration or just back off and they would have to back off. Because there mm -hmm. were times where Jesus actually, where there were crowds against him, he just, he walked through and they couldn't right. touch him. So there were times he exercised a little bit of that power. So he, he Jesus could have easily said enough of this. You can right. go backwards a little further when they were scourging him and beating him. Could he have said, no, absolutely. You go back before that. All, you can go back before Jesus was incarnate, what we were talking about in the last podcast, and right. even came and say, this isn't worth it. And, and I think this is why I'm so glad that God is God and we're not. Mm -hmm. Because our nature would have clearly been to say any at any point along the, the way, at least my own nature. Uh, I, I would like to think I'm a gracious, kind right. person, but am I so altruistic that I would believe that I would never, ever, um, you know, refuse my own suffering to help somebody else yeah. i mean just just in the last couple of days in our news cycle we 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 saw a man living on the streets who brutally abused a woman on her way to church yeah. it it, ha it happened to be a black man and an asian woman and there's a woman and there's a lot being made of that but it's one human being just brutally out of nowhere you know seemingly abusing and beating this woman who's still who's still injured right now yeah. um what was so heartbreaking is that the cameras that picked it up from within a building showed i think two or three onlookers yeah. watching this yeah. and then reaching over and closing the door after the guy left and this woman's laying in the street and you go 
you know, yeah, we're, we're all, if we're put in that moment where we have to take a risk upon ourselves, are we all, would we all, we, we, we like to fancy ourselves, I would sacrifice, I would suffer, I would be that good Samaritan, I would be that, I would be like Jesus and give myself. But few, few of us are. Yeah. And, and few of us have to be tested in that moment. And, and, and we ought to hope that we never have to be right. because we may not prove as, uh, as wonderful as we you know, fancy ourselves. And so, um, but, so G- at any point, Jesus could have said enough. He didn't. So, so the, question that, the question then becomes, well, then why would he come? Why would he have, you know, have those who are closest to him deny him and betray him and reject him and question him and still love them? Why would he be scourged and not stop it? Why would he take the nails? Why would he, while people were mocking him on the cross and even one of the thieves mocking him, not just say, that's it. Right. I've had it. You, you people are not worth it. I would do that. <laughs> because, yeah, because he could have. And I, and I, I would imagine right. most people listening, if they're honest, would say, I don't know if there's any human who's walked this earth except for Jesus because he was right. divine and because, because God is love. Mm-hmm. I can't imagine any other person enduring a fraction of that. For people who were spitting on his in his face, abusing him, and his closest friends running away, right. and and so, and so you know why didn't he? It was a choice. Uh, it, it was a choice. He came in love. He came to save. He came to redeem. He came to call us his own. He came to make a way back to heaven that he would offer to anyone who anyone even the most even even those who abused him right. he would offer that grace to them, and so nothing was going to stop Jesus. There was no person. No force of hell that could have stopped Jesus from doing what he purposed to do, and that was to go to the cross, to bear our shame, to take our burden, and to die in our place. Right. And so, so when, the, when the religious leaders mocked him and said, why don't you come down? When one of the thieves said, save yourself, you just know in Jesus' heart and mind, it's, no, I'm not in this moment to save myself. Right. I'm in this moment to save you. Mm. And whatever you do, whatever you say, however you act, I will not stop making a way back to heaven available to you. That's staggering. It, oh, yeah. it is yeah. overwhelming. Yeah, I, and I like that reminder of yeah. what an amazing sacrifice that yeah. was. And totally undeserving yeah. that we get yeah. that. Yeah. So he was up on the cross with two criminals mm-hmm. at the same time. Um, so other people were dying on crosses. That that was a normal yeah. kind of death of the day. You know, mm-hmm. that that was a punishment that yeah. happened. Um, but there's something unique about Jesus, and and I think what really makes this different is that he also had a resurrection yeah. from there. Um, tell me what you think is the, what's the, the real value in the, in not just the death, but that there was a resurrection that came from that. Yeah. And, yeah. and how does that change really the whole impact of this? Yeah. And there, there are people and even, even uh, people who would call themselves Christians. I would have a hard time. I would, I, well, I would not affirm that someone is a, is a biblical Christian if they don't affirm the resurrection. Um, you know, when Jesus died on the cross, you're right. It was a very, it was um, sadly and frightfully common uh, in, for in the Roman world to see people on crosses. Right. Uh, it was uh, you know, it, when the Romans made that a primary way as, to become a deterrent for bad behavior. Um, that's a deterrent for sure. <laughs> um, you know, it was it wasn't just that it, you know parents might say to their kids, you know, don't become a criminal. Right. They'd say, right. see that? I don't want to be that. <laughs> that's that's where it leads. Um, and so, uh, one of the one of the, a couple of thoughts. One, a primary difference between all other people who died on crosses and Jesus is that Jesus was the only one who died on a cross who was sinless, mm. who had never sinned. Now, there were probably, I would say, there were certainly people who died on crosses uh, in the Rome, under the Roman rule that weren't guilty of what they were accused, because there's people who go to prison for things that they're for accused of, sure. they're not birdie, uh, right. guilty of. That happens in our world, sadly. Uh, so there were probably some people who went to crosses that weren't guilty of what they were accused of, but they weren't sinless. Got it. Yeah. There were things that they had done that were wrong, as all human beings have, except for Jesus. Is that Jesus was a sinless Lamb of God? Mm-hmm. Um, now, had Jesus died on the cross and been buried, and three days later stayed buried, and three months later stayed buried, and three centuries later <laughs> stayed buried, um, the story of Jesus would be a radically different story, mm-hmm. because he spoke of his resurrection. His resurrection became the authentication of his what he was doing on the cross and paying the price for us. And so, and I'm sure we'll dig more into that, but, but had sure. Jesus not been raised from the dead, um, we would have to seriously question everything he said. Right. And when Jesus was raised from the dead, it became the stamp of, 
of affirmation that all he said was oh, true. That's a great word, affirmation. Yeah. yeah. So how, how would you see Jesus' resurrection being different? We, we hear of others in the Bible even yeah. um, that were dead, mm-hmm. and then they came back to life. Yeah, um, yeah. So his death was different yeah. than yeah. others, yeah. and his resurrection, I yeah. think, would be different yeah. than others. How, how do you yeah. see it different than the other resurrections in the Bible? Yeah, as a church, we just did a, a, a series on Elijah and Elisha. Mm-hmm. And if you go back to the times of Elijah and Elisha, there, there were dead people who were resurrected in the power of God. Mm-hmm. If you go in the days of Jesus, Jesus... Uh, said, Lazarus, come out, and Lazarus came out of the tomb. He said, Tabitha, rise, right. and this young girl came to life again. So Jesus actually raised people. And, and, but but here, here's, the, here's the difference. Um, I really look at, you know, in the days of Elijah and Elisha and with Lazarus and with this young girl and you know, others, they were all raised in the power of Jesus. They, they weren't raised by their own power. They were raised by an outside agent. Mm. Uh, and, and even when, with Elijah and Elisha, it was the power of God. And in our, in our first week in this podcast series, we talked about God as Father, Son, Holy Spirit. We dug into the Trinity a little bit. If God is at work, the Son is at work, and the Spirit is at work. And so even in Old Testament resurrections, the power of Jesus, the power of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit was there raising people. The difference with Jesus is he raised himself. Mm. He said, no one takes my life. I lay it down. I, I, I lay my life down. I can take it up again. And Jesus was emphatically clear that, and that starts to kind of tip the hand to, well, was it the Jewish people? Was it the Roman people? Um, well, all people are sins are what brought Jesus to come and right. lay his life down. But it wasn't the power of Rome that put Jesus on the cross. It wasn't the, the power of the Jewish, you know, kind of hierarchy and, and structure that put Jesus on the cross. It was Jesus' willingness to go to the cross. Mm-hmm. And so Jesus rose because he chose to rise and he rose in his own power. Anyone else who is raised, including us one day, at the resurrection mm-hmm. comes to the power of Jesus. And so Jesus, in every resurrection, Jesus is present. But in this case, he's raising himself. Gotcha. That's a whole different story. Yeah. So to start this off, I said, why was Jesus killed historically? Yeah. And you talked about the, the Jewish response and you talked about the, the Roman response. Mm-hmm. And then you said, uh, and then there's the theological reasoning behind yeah. it. Yeah. Um, but I'd love to dig into that a little bit more. Yeah. Uh, why was Jesus killed from a theological standpoint? Yeah. 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 And and so, you know, to me, all good theology, you know, theology is, is the study of God. All good theology is biblical theology. So we really, we really, you know, scour the pages of scripture from the Old Testament prophesying forward to the New Testament, declaring what happened, or from the Apostle Paul on, looking back at what happened. And they're all pointing, they're, you know, pointing to this moment of the crucifixion of Jesus, uh, the resurrection of Jesus, the ascension of Jesus and the the present working of Jesus, the risen Christ. He wasn't just risen, but he is alive. He's present here right now. And so, uh, and this 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 could be a series. You could do a podcast on each of these responses. But um, Jesus, you know, why was Jesus killed? Why was Jesus on the cross? Uh, you know, back 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 to this. You know, what was what was God doing on the cross? Mm-hmm. Um, he was paying for sin. Our sin, not his own. He, Jesus was the the spotless Lamb of God, and so he was he was paying for our sin. He was dying in our place. Uh, the, the theological term is a substitutionary atonement, hmm. uh, meaning the atonement, the payment for our sins, came by a substitution. I couldn't pay for my sins. You couldn't pay for your sins. Someone would have to pay the price for us. So as Jesus was on the cross, he was literally, from a spiritual standpoint, bearing our sins, taking our shame in our place, taking the punishment we deserved upon himself and wiping it clean. And, and so um, that, you know, th- that is, and all, all of that is kind of wrapped in the simple concept of love. You know, why was, you know what, why was Jesus killed theologically? Because God loves us. Because God looked at our situation and realized we could not save ourselves. God realized that our sins and our wrongs had separated us from him and we couldn't, you know, kind of weigh out the scales with enough good things to tip the scales. Uh, our sin, much too heavy. You know, one sin, you know, from a theological standpoint, one sin is eternally heavy because it's against an eternal God. And so 10 good things or a thousand good things don't outweigh one right. sin. Well, we got a whole lot more than one sin. So why did Jesus come? Why did he die on the cross? Because out of love, the Father sent him. Out of love, Jesus obeyed and came. And out of love, he bore our sins, took our shame, and washed it away and he actually died they actually buried him he was dead for three days and he rose again 
But what put him there, so, so I, when I look at the, the story, the historical context, and everyone, everyone in our world loves pointing fingers. Well, we don't, we rarely paint, point fingers at ourselves. For sure. <laughs> but we love pointing fingers at other people. And so, so it's like, well, it, you know, it, it's the, the Jewish establishment's fault. It's the Roman government's fault. Uh, ultimately, even it's the sins of human beings' fault. Well, in a, there's a sense that all of those have a measure of truth to them. Right. But had Jesus not chosen to go to the cross, he wouldn't have gone to the cross. So ultimately, he was there by his own sovereign choice of his love and, and his grace coming to give his life for people who totally didn't deserve it. And and even to this day, he says, for all who will receive me, it's available. And that's that's um, that's the good news of the gospel. Yeah. You know, on, on the cross, we see the greatest act of love and sacrifice ever given. Not just as some people want to make it sort of a... So, so that's, you know, it's a model of self-sacrifice, so we should be self-sacrificing. That's what the Christian faith is about. No. Maybe as a secondary or tertiary thing. But primarily, it's about a God who loved us, who gave his life on the cross in our place so an infinite sacrifice could cover the depth of infinite sins and wash us clean. Now, should we follow the example of Jesus, take up our cross and follow him? Yeah, Jesus said we should. Right, absolutely. But the primary Jesus, reason Jesus was on the cross was not because of any other person, any political power, <clears throat> any religious power. It was a choice of Jesus to give his life for us. And I think we need to linger there. And that's really why it's so good every Good Friday and every Easter to kind of come back to this same, this same place. I, I, was, I told a couple of guys this, uh, just a little, a little, um, a little church joke uh, on Sunday. <laughs> and they, they said, you ought to use that on Easter Sunday. I said, well, it's not funny enough for an Easter Sunday, but it is maybe funny enough for a podcast. There you go. So, let's, let's hear it. So, uh, but but it's, it's, just, it's just a real simple, simple pastor joke where this, uh, this couple comes up to a pastor after a Christmas service and, and says, you know, Pastor, you got to get some new material because every time we come to church, you're either talking about the birth of Jesus or the resurrection, the birth of Jesus. You got, you got, is that all you got? And the pastor said, well, you got to come to church sometime other than Christmas and Easter. <laughs> and it's like, because every year we are going to, we are going to lean into those things. And so, like I said, it's not a great joke. But it made me laugh. Yeah. I think that is a fairly good joke. I, yeah. I knew where you were going right yeah. when you started that one. That's kind of funny. Yeah. Well, that's, that's, that's the sign of a great joke because the people know the answer. They know the punchline before you say it. No. Well, you, you said earlier you talked about being altruistic and you'd love to be the one that, that made the sacrifice. And yeah. I'm glad you're not God because I don't know if I could do that. Um, I know for me, I, I'm not God, obviously, but I cannot imagine that I would put myself out there on the cross mm -hmm. to die for people that hated me. Yeah. Uh, so for everybody, right? Yeah. Some that hated me, some that didn't know me, but um, for, for some reason, God chose to do this, mm -hmm. and, and I think almost that it had to be necessary. Yeah. Um, do you yeah. do you have that sense? And if so, why mm -hmm. why was it necessary mm -hmm. for Him to actually yeah. die on the cross? Yeah. yeah, yeah, and I think two two big theological words at, at in that discussion would be holiness and justice. Mm. Um, God is holy. You know, the, in the ancient world, the way you emphasized something was you repeated it, you repeated it, you repeated it. And three repetitions was sort of the maximum. And I, my, my theory is because the fourth time it just gets irritating. Right, but, it's just know, annoying. So, so if God, if God is, is ultimately holy, he's holy, holy, holy. Uh, and so, um, you know, God, God who is perfectly holy cannot look the other way and ignore sin. It has to be dealt with. Well, if human beings sin, and we have, uh, if we're separated from God because of that sin, and we are, and if God wants to bring us back into relationship with him in this loving relationship, which he does, then the sin has to be dealt with. God is perfectly holy. He sees our sin. He can't look the other way. God is perfectly just. So there, there has to be a righteous payment. And so either we pay the price or someone else pays it for us. And ultimately, we can't even pay the price because we, aren't, uh, we don't have enough goodness in us to, to, to pay the price, to make things right, to atone for our own wrongs and for our own sins. And so it's necessary because God, who is perfectly holy, and because of that has to stay separate of sin, God is perfectly just and must resolve and deal with sin, that God's solution was to offer someone who would be this intermediate uh, one who would pay the price for us. And that one had to be truly human and truly divine. Hmm. And there was no such being before Jesus came among us. Jesus existed eternally in divinity, 
But somehow Philippians 2 talks about he empties himself, came as one of us, takes on human flesh, the form of a servant, and, and went even to the bitter and shameful death of the cross. And so Jesus comes as one who is fully human so he can die in our place, fully divine so his payment is great enough to pay the price against a perfectly holy God. And in the death of Jesus on the cross, God's holiness is satisfied, his justice is satisfied, and redemption is offered to us, not forced on us, Mm, but offered to us. And all who would put their faith in Jesus can receive that and, and be in God's presence now and eternally, not because we were good enough, but because he's good enough. And so it, 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 all those pieces come together in the cross. And the, one of the words you just used there was atone, yeah. to atone mm-hmm. for our sins. Can mm-hmm. you dig a little yeah. bit deeper into what atonement actually yeah. means, yeah. the significance yeah. of that? Yeah. Um, if you looked at a dictionary, it would say something like, you know, a, a taking action to pay back for something you've done. So if somebody's okay. stolen something, they atone by paying back for it. If somebody's gotcha. hurt someone, they atone. And even in the Old Testament, there's times where it says, if, if you let your, if you let your, you know, beast of burden wander wild and you don't keep it fenced in and it injures somebody, you can atone for that by paying back such and such, you know, they, to, to make things right. So the question is when we've, if we've sinned against a holy God, can we atone by doing X amount of good things? And, 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 and even if the, and so many people, I believe in so many, um, even in Christian churches have this idea that their own personal behavior has to, you know, the, the atonement for their sins is some kind of a, kind of a combination of what Jesus did on the cross and then a certain amount of good things I do. Right. The dilemma is how many good things do I have to do? Is it 14 and then I'm in? Is it 214? Is it 14,000 good things? If, if there's a certain amount of good things I have to do to atone for my wrong, then, I, then somebody has to measure out, well, what's the weight of my wrong? What's the weight, rate of my good? And then how much does Jesus help me? And then how much does my good things push it over the edge? Well, that's not what the Bible teaches at all. Right. And so so can, can human atonement pay the price? No. In the Old Testament, there was a ritual of atonement where they would take, a, and we get the term scapegoat. We still use that term in our culture today, a scapegoat, is we put blame on somebody else for something we did. Well, in the ancient Jewish world, they would actually take a goat and through a whole ritual and process would sort of have the sense of taking the sins of the people and placing it on the goat and then shooing the goat and letting the goat go away as a picture of the wrongs of people being taken away right. on, on, on the back of or the head of on that goat. Um, so can my atonement, my good things atone for my sin? No. Can a, a goat atone for my sin? No. That was a symbolic picture to prepare people for the coming of Christ the final lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And so so in, in Romans 5, 8, we read that you know, while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. He atoned for us as he died for us. He paid the price. And so I think as if you're a follower of Jesus to say, I'm not going to spend my time trying to atone for my own sins, mm-hmm. um, that there isn't some ritual that will atone for my sins, but there is one who we celebrate when we gather on Good Friday, which as we're filming, this is tomorrow. Right. So this is all kind of in my heart and my mind right now. And Tom, it's a great timing to be talking about this because it's <laughs> I'm preaching Good Friday and Easter Sunday. And so I'm thinking about these are all kind of in my heart and my mind. Um, but, but there is one who came to atone to pay for what I couldn't pay for, to pay back what I couldn't pay back, right. to heal what I've broken that I couldn't heal. And so if we, if we lean on Christ's atonement, we then are washed clean. Hmm. Yeah. Earlier I asked you how the resurrection of Jesus mm-hmm. was different than the other biblical resurrections that we which see. Uh, and, and you really talked about from a historical context how it was different mm-hmm. and in that moment how it uh, affected those people there and kind of allowed the Christian faith to go go on. Yeah. But for us today, mm-hmm. uh, I think we can still ask the question is, what is the significance mm-hmm. of, of his resurrection? So today, how would mm-hmm. you see yeah. uh, his resurrection being significant for Christians yeah. today? Yeah. Well, I'll tell you, I'll tell you a little story and then I'll, I'll give you two thoughts on that. And again, there's lots more that can be said. But um, my, uh, my wife was in a training uh, children's ministry training for this curriculum that had been developed by these these couple people who were you know really caring about kids and wanted them to learn about Jesus, and uh, and but but they had the people that developed this curriculum had really become errant theologically, mm. and they didn't want to talk about sin when they talked to kids. They thought well, that would bother kids. They didn't want to. So they, if you don't talk about sin, you can't talk about things like the atonement. Uh, and they were they were um, I think not giving the kids enough credit, but also tipping their hand to their theological disposition that. Um, that Christ, 
uh, they wouldn't talk about blood or sacrifice. And they kept saying, well, it's because we don't want to upset kids. But at the end of the day, you have to speak the truth even when it's upsetting. And so, uh, so one of the things that, that, that uh, was said in, by, by some of the people that were organizing this curriculum, and there were churches that were saying, we can't really use that because it doesn't, um, it doesn't really follow the biblical teaching on who Christ is, the fullness of what that is. And so one of the people who were part of that made this statement. They said, well, you know, honestly, if they were to find the bones of Jesus tomorrow, it wouldn't affect my faith one bit. Hmm. Now, you have to kind of okay, pause. Okay, if they found the bones of Jesus tomorrow, but Jesus rose. He didn't stay in the grave. So what are they saying? If Jesus didn't really rise from the dead, right. it wouldn't change my faith at all. And I just that's one of those moments I go, ah, ding, red flag, <laughs> time out. Um, words mean things. And a statement like that is really saying, you don't think the resurrection matters. Right. And that's exactly what they were saying. Because they didn't actually believe that Jesus, I don't know if they were even sure if Jesus really lived, died, or rose again. But right. at that point, they had this wonderful curriculum for kids. But the problem was it was leading kids away from Jesus hmm. to a false Jesus. And that's dangerous. Yeah. We didn't use the curriculum. I, good, um, <laughs> good call. Good call. Some churches said, "Well, can we just tweak a little bit and add that stuff back in?" And I'm like, "I think that's a bad idea too, because you're starting with, uh, with, kind of garbage and trying to sweeten it up with a little bit of Jesus in there." And so, uh, so, so here, here's the two things that that I think, two things that I'll touch on that we haven't touched on already about the resurrection. I mean, we've talked about the fact that his death and the resurrection is part of our salvation. It's part of his sacrifice, all that. But um, one of the things that makes it significant is that it validates everything Jesus said. Hmm. Had Jesus, if they found the bones of Jesus tomorrow, had he not risen from the dead, then all that he taught and all that he said would really, should be questioned. It would be lies, right? It'd be, it'd, be, it'd be lies, yeah. Because he, it was all based on the fact that I'm not just a you know, suffering rabbi, I'm not just a moral example, mm -hmm. but I am God who's come among you. And that I, what I lay down, I'll take up again. And so I think that, that, that validation of what Jesus said and taught um, comes through the resurrection. And then also, and this is a huge one, our resurrection is tied in with the resurrection of Jesus. In 1 Corinthians 15, the Apostle Paul says, basically, if Jesus didn't rise, go have a party. Right. Eat, drink, be merry. Yeah, but, but, don't, but don't spend your life following Jesus. Right. If he didn't rise, guess what? You're not rising either. Because if Jesus didn't rise, there is no resurrection. And so, you know, what's the significance of the, of the resurrection? It also becomes existential, deeply personal. Hmm. If Christ didn't rise, um, I wouldn't be a pastor. I wouldn't be doing what I'm doing. Uh, if Christ didn't rise, this is this is all there is. And so, and, and, and this is why a lot of people a lot of people live that way. Mm -hmm. They don't believe in anything beyond themselves. Uh, and I think that the more pervasive, I just read a statistic this morning that at this point in the whole whole COVID um, moment that our world is in. In America, the, there's there's always been a majority of people who say, I go to church, over 51%. Right. We just had the first time in American history where it's a minority of people who identify as at least being churchgoers of some sort. I don't Going to church doesn't make you a Christian right. at right. all, but uh, there's something to that. And so, um, you know, if we lived as if there was nothing beyond this life, if we lived as if there's nothing before this life and we're just a random happening of... of chemicals and you know primal ooze and there's no, there's nothing to this it doesn't it, it doesn't shock me the way that you know people who don't believe in jesus the way they often live n nothing shocks me right because if i didn't believe what i believe i can't even imagine what what my life would be I, if i didn't care if i there, there, there would be and people say well no but people should just be good because it's good to be good right uh, that's not working out very well. No. On a, on a cultural level, on a global level, uh, there's not a lot of people that are just good because it's good to be good, and and they, they have the strength to do that. May, there, there may be a handful of people. I don't, I don't think I'd be one of them mm -hmm. if I didn't believe in Jesus. I remember years ago, a, a, a church leader. I've been a Christian for about two years or so, and this church leader said to me, he said, Kevin, I'm glad you're a Christian, and I'm glad you're on our side. And I said, I said, what, what does that mean? He goes. I just wouldn't want to see you if you weren't a Christian. <laughs> and I was like, it was kind of offensive. And it was kind of, I was like, I was young. I was like, maybe I was maybe like 18 or 19, a fairly young Christian and very passionate about my faith. But he just said, he just kind of said, kind of like, you'd be a very dangerous person if you weren't a Christian. And I, I look back now and I know, I know what he meant. Um, if, 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 
There's nothing before this and nothing after this. If Christ hasn't risen, and the Apostle Paul, again, for the listeners, read 1 Corinthians 15 this, this season, whether you're watching this at post-Easter or, or in the middle of the year, at some, you know, it'll be online forever. So, but, but read 1 Corinthians 15, and it will show you the absolute importance of the resurrection, uh, not just for our salvation, but also for our resurrection. Yeah. And for you, it sounds like you're saying that this is foundational, like a cornerstone yeah. of your faith. Yeah. For the listener, why would you say for 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 me and for them yeah. that this event mm-hmm. that we that we celebrate mm-hmm. this weekend or we remember this weekend, why would you say that that is the cornerstone yeah. of the Christian yeah. faith or yeah. so necessary to yeah. be part of it yeah. for yeah. for each of us? If there is no resurrection of Jesus, there's no resurrection for us. It's a cornerstone because if there is no resurrection of Jesus, uh, he was not the Lord, but he was a deceiver. Uh, If there is no resurrection of Jesus, there is no ultimate victory. Mm. Uh, And death wins. Uh, I would say hell and Satan win, but people don't believe in the resurrection, don't believe in those kind of things. But death is is the end. Um, If there is no resurrection of Jesus, this life... I believe becomes a random thing that having any sense of meaning, uh, we, we could, and this was one of my, my challenges talking with my dad through the years, for the 40 plus years before he gave his heart to Jesus. As I said, dad, why? Because my dad was not a, a overtly evil person. He was a relatively good person, relatively good. Right. Uh, but I would say to my dad, what, the, what do you base your life on? And he said, well, I believe that there are, there are, um, tangible, real things that are, he's, he's, I believe that beauty is real and kindness is real, that they, that they have actual being to them. And he went through these, these nine different, there's, there's a book called Nine, nine Great Ideas, but you know, these <laughs> different things, I believe in those things. And I said, but who establishes those? Who makes those real? He says, I guess they just, I think just, they just exist in and of themselves. And I said, and you believe that by? And he said, by faith. <laughs> and I said, so we're not so far apart, are we? I said, I just believe in the God who makes those things real. Mm-hmm. And I think that was part of my dad's journey to finally surrendering his heart to Jesus. But, um, but, but the, the, the resurrection of Jesus is a cornerstone of the Christian faith. To deny the resurrection, to say it doesn't matter, I think is to compromise the Christian faith and to really declare I'm not a biblical Christian. And one of the beauties of, of the resurrection is that uh, for us as followers of Jesus, and I'll, I'll, I'll kind of wrap up my, my part of this podcast with this thought, um, that when we're baptized, it, it's a beautiful picture of us being buried with Jesus in baptism and raised again to new life. No matter how much water a church tradition uses, mm-hmm. the picture is, uh, Romans chapter 6 says, we are buried therefore with Christ in baptism and raised again to new life. And I had a chance this last, just, just a couple days ago, to uh, baptize a young woman who has... Uh, had a long, she's young, but she's had a long series of challenges in her life and struggles. And she made a commitment to Jesus a while back, but she's taken some new steps forward in her life. She'd never been baptized. And she said, could you baptize me? And to, to step into a hot tub of one of her neighbors with, with some friends and family gathered around and to, to take her under the water and, and to say, you know, I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit to see her come out of the water. Um, a picture of this new life in Christ. Um, if Christ has not been raised, there is no hope of resurrection. There is no hope of anything beyond this because he's the source of all those things. And so I would say as I look forward to Good Friday tomorrow and Easter coming up, uh, he is risen. He is risen indeed. And all praise to Jesus. I've had a few moments in my Christian journey mm-hmm. that have been profound in me getting a deeper understanding of God's love. Yeah. So thank you. Today was one of those. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you can hear it in my voice. Yeah. I'm getting this new or renewed yeah. understanding of how great God's love yeah. is for yeah. us. And yeah. it's my hope and it's my prayer that everybody who listens to this yeah. can have that same taste yeah. that God loves us so much that he mm-hmm sent his son to die for our sins, yeah. but that he was then raised to life yeah. so that we can have new life. Yeah. Uh, thank you so much yeah. for that today. You bet. Amen. Thanks for tuning in. And whether you're watching on our YouTube channel or listening on your podcast app, make sure to subscribe to hear more episodes as we release them. This is a weekly-ish podcast. So 
we will be putting out uh, episodes typically every Wednesday. So make sure to subscribe if you don't want to miss them.